Hi, and welcome to Filmmaker Central. And today we have a special guest with us today, Pat McGowan from Blackbox. Welcome, Pat. Hey, man. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And uh, hey. now, um, a lot of people don't know what Blackbox is, and there's people that know what stock footage is. So where does Blackbox play into the stock footage game? Well, let's start kind of high level. We'll go up to 30,000 feet. Uh, Black Box was designed as a what we call a group working and a sharing platform for content creators. So they can do a few things. First thing we want them to be able to do is get access to global markets without killing themselves. And the second and very important thing we want them to be able to do is be able to collaborate, co-own the content that they make together virtually and globally and then be able to share the revenue painlessly with no risk. So that's really what we set it up for. So as far as the stock footage market goes, that's really the first market that we decided to take our concept into. So again, it's group working and sharing. So uh, what we do is it's kind of two key things. We, um, we help the creators get their content to the major Microsoft platforms out there. So that's Shutterstock, Pond5, Adobe, Storyblocks, and uh, now Vimeo. And if they're collaborating with two or more people doing job functions on that content, they can actually split ownership of the clips and therefore receive a percentage of the revenue. So that's the platform as it is today. Now, I've actually used that uh, when, when I got started. I, I had, I don't know, 550 clips to do, like, uh, from mining old data on my hard drives. And mm -hmm. to, the thought of trying to do all the metadata and the, the keywording, the descriptions and all that stuff, it was a little daunting to try and do with oh, almost 600 clips. And so I took your advice and I, I found a curator on there. And he did some a much better job at doing the keywording and, and descriptions than I would have done, uh, especially anything that I had done in the past with uh, going to the agencies myself. So that, that ability for him to go in there to the stuff that I uploaded and add that data, I think was very valuable and, and certainly a, a huge time savings for me. I could just focus on getting the content out there. Well, you know, the way I look at it is we say you can do what you love. So basically do the job that you like to do. So if you like being behind the camera, be behind the camera. If you like being in front of the camera, be a model or an actor in front of the camera. If you like uh, actually doing database work and keywords and that kind of thing, do that. If you want to edit, you can do that. So we like to see curators doing both jobs, actually edit and uh, do the keywording and metadata. So really... Instead of sometimes the way I look at it, it's like, well, not only am I doing what I'm, I love, I'm not doing what I don't love. And I think that's kind of the category you fell into is you didn't have to do the things that you didn't like to do. And there are actually people in the world that do like to do those jobs. You know, they're, they're metadata geeks and, uh, and they enjoy doing it and they bring a lot of value to the exercise because, as you say, they're going to do a better job keywording. They're, I don't know if they're going to do a better job editing or not, but they're bringing a third eye to it. And when a great editor brings a third eye to the content that is shot by videographers and cinematographers and DOPs. So, you know, this is a collaborative uh, pursuit. You know, great visual art is not generally made by one-man teams. And, and I think that that was a barrier. Well, I'll go a little further on that. Ever since uh, the dawn of what I call platformization, which in the music business was uh, Napster, and now we've got Spotify and Apple Music uh, to deal with in the music realm, uh, content creators have kind of been forced to to work on their you know on their own devices, right? So, and I don't mean electronic devices, but they're left to their own devices by this this uh, new way of doing things that's supposed to liberate them. And in some ways it does, because the tools are definitely better and more refined, but there's less collaboration going on. And I maybe I'm old school, but I really think that that's something that we need to pay attention to. And so a, a huge part of, of why I ideated this platform was to bring collaboration back to content creation that is done by people that want to do their own thing. So do your own thing together, basically, is what it is. 
So the stock footage example, really, we did this first because what we wanted to do was prove the concept, build a community, and make sure that it worked and it was rock solid. And so far, it's really been incredibly successful. I will say uh, it's not for everyone. If you're a lone wolf creator and you're used to doing everything yourself and have maximum control over every single pixel and every single clip that you make and, and plotting all your revenue and where it is and all of that, it's probably not for you. This is for people that want to go hands-free, hands-off, upload it and forget it, know that their content uh, creator collaborators are going to get paid, same as them, and to do it with a trusted partner who isn't going to skim or steal from them. And that's definitely not what we do. Maybe it's because we're from Canada. I don't know. It's just <laughs> not in our DNA to do that, you know? So, and we had to deal with all of that. Like, we had to deal with a lot of suspicion, a lot of cynicism from people, um, you know, who just didn't think that this was possible. Well, it's possible. We've been at it for a year. I'm not pitching here, by the way. So we've been at it for a year. We have a million clips in play and growing. We have 45,000 people who have registered for this platform. And we have had zero failures on payment or revenue share. That's zero. No problems. Uh, cross, you know, crossing my fingers now that uh, I haven't changed myself there. But honestly, we're really proud of, of what we've done. And, and, uh, and I think, kind of, you know, one of the things that I, I love most is that I'm a content creator. And I know this sounds like a slogan or bullshit, but I actually care about my fellow creators. I don't want them to have a hard time making a living. I don't want to see them commodified as labor and getting lower and lower rates every year and having a tougher time finding good paying gigs because I was that guy. And, uh, you know, I went through that disruption. I know, I know the pain. And I figure there's got to be a, a different way, if not even a better way of doing things. So black box is, is my way of kind of putting that into a business framework. So we started with stock footage and our next move will be into short form for platforms like YouTube and then long form for uh, VOD and streaming platforms. That's really where we're at. That's really interesting. Now, um, so you said it's been running for about a year now. Uh, that means I was actually pretty early on uh, joining up because I've been at it for uh, almost a year now. And you were, you were, you were one of the early adopters. Um, and thanks for sticking around. <laughs> well, I mean, and you know, I, I asked you some very tough questions back then, uh, and you were you were very responsive, and I really appreciated that because I had come from stock photography, and I had been starting on stock footage. And to, to look at a revenue share model for just being on a platform, uh, I, I was certainly very skeptical about that. And, you know, you start looking at, at numbers and percentages and it's, it just seems a little, you know, it, it was tough for me to, to grasp the value uh, proposition there. And it didn't take me long to, to sit there and go, okay, look, I, I use an FTP software. I upload to all these sites. I try and wait for them to all be in the platform, and then I, I bring up the same clip on, on four different platforms, and you can't even copy and paste from one to another because each one has a different way of doing keywords. Each one has a different way of doing things. And just to do one clip was just so much effort. And looking at the black box platform, I could just put it all in there, submit, I'm done. I, it was one shot deal, saving saving yeah. me by myself just a tremendous amount of time, and then working with um, some curators on you know the bulk projects. Well, I mean, there's just no question the amount of time that that was spent. So uh, why don't we kind of step back there a little bit and and talk about what does that yeah. revenue share uh, model look like between the creator and Black Box? Well, let's take a look at. Uh, a two-person team, okay? So let's say, Dave, you're a shooter, which you are, and I'm an editor slash curator. So I live in Ottawa, Canada, and where is it that you live again? I'm in uh, Denver, Colorado. Yeah, so you're in Denver and I'm up in Ottawa. 
And it wouldn't matter if I was in Porto, Portugal, or if I was in Botswana or Vietnam. It wouldn't matter, okay? Because we've got this thing called the Internet that actually connects us. And the whole point of the Internet was to be able to do collaborative work. That's why the Internet was invented by scientists way back in the 80s or 70s or whenever they got this thing going. So, uh, you know, it wasn't about uh, apps at that time. It was about collaboration. So, anyways, uh, here's the thing. You've got footage that you shot today. So let's say you went out to whatever. You went to a cafe today that a friend of yours owned, and you had a couple of uh, people show up who are models, and they did a bunch of coffee shops stuff for you. And you got them to sign release forms. But most importantly, you, you don't have to pay them. You can actually give them a revenue share on the content that they made with you because they are a creator too. And maybe even the coffee shop owner gets a split. So now we've got Dave, who's the shooter. We've got two models who are the actors. And we've got the coffee shop owner who owns the location. And then we got Pat up in Ottawa who is going to take your raw footage, which you can get to me either electronically if we both have super fast internet, or you can send it to me on a hard drive physically or a jump drive or a thumb drive or whatever you want. It all depends, right? So I get the content, I do the selects, I pair them down, I choose the best content, which is an editor's job, and then I color correct it and I may have to stabilize it or I may have to do some other processing maybe some noise removal, maybe you've got some spec removal that you need done, and that's all part of the gig. And then what I do is I export those clips, and then I export them and upload them to your account because you created a project and invited me to upload to your account. So now your clips are in your account, and I can now either using a CSV database methodology or within the actual editor on the application itself, enter all the keywords, the descriptions, get those uh, uh, model releases where they need to be, do a quality check, make sure everything is good to go, and then I submit. And what, after I submit, you get a notification saying, check this work. So let's just say it's all good. So you check the work and you hit submit. And then what we do at Blackbox is as soon as you hit submit, we're going to, first of all, do an internal review of the content to make sure it's uh, technically sound. And the next thing that we do is we send it off to our agency partners. So after a period of time, all the agencies will do their review process. Some will accept it, some might not, and it'll be in the market. And the next thing you should be getting is a sales notification. And here's the really cool thing. When you get a sales notification, so do I, <clears throat> so do the two models, and so does the location on it. Because we all have to be registered for Blackbox to get a revenue share. So what goes out in an email goes out to five people. And let's say you retain 40% because you're the originator of the project, and maybe each model is getting 10%. The location owner is getting 10%, in which case you would get less because I'm going to get 40 for doing my work. Uh, Anyways, it's, it's really just slicing the pie and then locking that so that your pie slice is always the same. And then for, if it's a great clip or if you've got 30 great clips, every time one of those clips sells on any one of those platforms, you get your share of the revenue for as long as they're on the platform generating revenue. And it can really add up. Of course, it depends on the content and the demand, but we do our job of getting it out to market and then doing the revenue splits when the money comes back in. Uh, and, you know, and I looked at it from the perspective of what would I want if I was doing collaboration with somebody, and I've been a producer, director, uh, shooter, I'm a wildlife cinematographer, I've been a musician all my life, I've been in media for 35 years. And the big problem that we always have as creators is that the business gets in the way. So what we try to do with this platform is make that fade into the background, where the business fades into the background. It's not the most important thing. And in fact, most creators are really not interested in or very good at the business parts. And so they rely on other people, and that's sometimes where you run into problems. So what this, this platform does is, it, is it, it automates those back office tasks and the business tasks 
that you need to, to, to not worry about so that you can actually do what you are good at, and that's making great content. And that actually contributes to scalability, and it contributes to a real spirit of empowerment and a real spirit of community globally. And that's one of the things I'm, I'm just so excited about with this platform is we actually have a very functional community uh, uh, on this portal, on our Facebook group, and and when we release our new community portal, which should be happening soon, uh, there's going to be even more of that going on, where we're really connecting people at a global level so that they can be what they are, which is creators working together uh, on in teams. And you're not locked into a team. You can work with any group of people you want. And, uh, you know, it's the benefits are really starting to show themselves. So people who bought into this, who, who really took it seriously, are seeing amazing results. Other people, I mean, it's like anything else. You, you reap what you sow. You get in what you put, put into it. But here, you know, you just don't have to do some of the bullshit that you don't like doing. Okay, now, okay. This, this, let's, let's be real. This is a business. You know, you're not doing this for the, the fun of it. Where does Black Box make their money, and how does that come out of the sale? Okay, so let's just take an example on a $100 sale at an agency, okay? So an agency, and let's just say for the sake of argument that the agency pays 40%. So the agency keeps 60 which isn't unfair because it's very expensive to run these platforms. You've got all kinds of costs, server costs, uh, SEO, uh, Advertising, sales. everything, yeah. Uh, it's extremely expensive to run these platforms. So um, so it's a $100 sale on a clip of a guy jumping on a trampoline. So someone's jumping on a trampoline, someone buys this clip on a license uh, through the Microsoft platform for 100 bucks. So Blackbox receives $40 on that sale. And then we will carve out 15% revenue share for ourselves, so $6. So Black Box takes a $6 commission, and then the rest goes to the creator. Uh, so it's a $34 net sale for the creator. And when we do the payment, we also levy a 2% finance handling charge. Uh, we pay through PayPal. Yeah, and that... That's, that's it, it's that simple. Yeah, I mean, it, and that, that to me was one of the, the early questions I had for you a year ago was, you know, is that really worth it? Is that too much? I mean, what, uh, and, uh, you know, to me, once I got into the platform, I'm like, you know, what, that, that, whatever, you know, I'm, I was making more money quickly. I was making, quickly making more money with my stuff on Black Box than I was doing it on, the other platforms. And I think that had to do with collaborating with some good uh, curators to get better keywords and better metadata out there. And, uh, but does there, is there a benefit for my content to be under black boxes account versus being under my own account on there? Is, is there SEO benefits or things like that, that would draw someone to it one way versus the other? So in terms of draw to content, um, that's a question we get asked a lot. A lot of people feel that their personal brand is of value and that they make more sales uh, because they're able to direct people to their content. And yeah, you know, that, I suppose that's true. But um, when you're part of a larger portfolio, um, rumor has it, okay, because I don't run these platforms and I cannot speak to you definitively about about whether this is true or not true, we just know anecdotally, because we've done some A-B testing, is that uh, having a portfolio and being part of the black box uh, portfolio on these various platforms seems to have a benefit on sale uh, sales numbers. We believe it's because, um, and I can't speak for these agencies and I'm not going to, we believe uh, it's possible that agencies may um, may uh, favor uh, hot selling contributors, uh, but I don't know if that's absolutely true or not. So anecdotally, we suspect it's true, uh, but I'm not going to answer the question. And it, and it, and it may be different depending on which agency the footage is with, too, based on their own algorithms. Right. All of these agencies are private companies. Uh, some are publicly held companies. 
They all do a very good job, some better than others. We have some really super, super uh, companies in there. And, uh, you know, they're, they're in it to make money, too. I mean, they charge uh, usually about 60%. Uh, some, uh, some we get a slightly better deal on, but again, I can't go into the details on that, but we put that right through to our, our members. So, because we have a scalable, we have a, you know, we have a big portfolio. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I'm just going to say that this wasn't designed to be an SEO enhancement tool. This was designed to be a save a lot of hassle tool by getting to agencies in the formats that they need, properly vetted, technically sound footage, uh, and to do the revenue splits because I see that as a massive benefit for creators where if they, they can work collaboratively and not worry about somebody skimming or not getting paid. I mean, you know, it's like this whole thing in the film business about deferrals. I mean, is this, this joke? It's a running joke. Have you ever been paid on a deferral? And everyone laughs. No one gets paid on deferrals. But what this is, is a guaranteed deferral. So everybody's working in kind together. There's nobody getting paid to do the work. And you do the stuff that you want to do. You have an incredible amount of freedom. When you're doing your work, you don't have a client. You don't have a boss. You don't have a partner. Uh, well, what you have is a collaborative team member. So the rules of the game are different. And we believe that that contributes to uh, more harmonious relationships, and it also contributes to higher quality content because you are actually accountable to your team members to enhance the value of the product, not just do your gig and get paid. And that's a huge difference in terms of how people think about it. And in fact, you know, I've been doing this for a long time, and I know you have too. Collaboration, in my view, beats competition any day of the week. <laughs> yeah. I would have you to have to be that. a special person to actually be able to live that. And guess what? Creators are those people. In general, I will say that 99.9% .9 of the people I've met in my career are almost to a fault. Kind, smart, talented, generous, hardworking, very tenacious, fair people right this is our this is our population so part of my dream for black box is that we become uh, a platform for creators to actually just be creators and not apologize to anybody about it and find the value that we represent in, in what we call the value chain uh, as a business uh, so what we're doing is we're bringing business benefits to individual creators it's not just it's not about me becoming rich or anything like that. Maybe I will make some money. I mean, I hope so. Uh, but frankly, you know, I've been around this for long enough to know that the truly great people in this industry did not get into it for the money. The truly great people in this industry, the A Lewis that I've had the honor of working with, are generally very nice people, very tolerant, uh, smart, talented, hardworking gifted and those are the people that i want to spend the rest of my life with uh, honestly um so you know i know we're kind of touching on a lot of general stuff here and that's philosophical but i do want people to know that this whole idea came from this desire to do right by creators and and me personally as a creator to be done right by because frankly um you know uh we had some bumps and scrapes along the way and and there was no other way actually to do that rather than to say, hey, let's just let's just be creators together and figure this out. Because the internet is this wonderful tool that allows us to do this. We could not have done this 20 years ago. It would not be possible. Right, right. So we could create a global ecosystem in a year, which we did. And now we're looking for ways to make it even better, even more productive, so that you know, the platform and the ecosystem is a place where people can, you know, get better at what they do, get better connected. I and mean, we got some stuff coming up that is really going to turn heads on this whole line of what does sharing really mean? So what does group working, collaboration, and sharing really mean to a creator? What do you want? What do you need? 
And uh, it really comes down to resources, relationships, and a fair deal in the marketplace. So we've got some, some really big ambitions and really big ideas. And I don't see any reason why we can't go there at all. There, there's nothing that can stop us from doing that. Well, now you're, the, what you're, the comment there was that you, you see this uh, continuing to grow, you, you, the direction you want to head this in. And one of the kind of the hesitations that I had early on in even signing up for stock footage was 10 years of doing stock photography. And I watched my images go from $35 a sale down to 25 cents a sale. And it, where do you see things going over the next two, five, or, or maybe even 10 years, if you want to be so bold as to think that far out? Well, I've been involved in MicroStock for six years, okay? So, and I don't know, I, I have 6,000 clips on Blackbox. I'm, I'm a member just like everybody else. So, uh, and I put my very valuable content onto this platform because I believed in it. Uh, I have yet to see a price decrease in MicroStock, okay? So the average sales that I make for each clip that I sell, I sell have actually gone up a little bit in the past six years because there are a lot more enhanced license sales coming through. Uh, 4K has yet to hit its stride. I'm not even sure if it will, frankly. Most footage is being sold in HD resolutions. Um, and until, uh, but I think there's something interesting going on here. As the supply of content goes up, the ability for higher level productions to use it as a production element also goes up. So I think what we're seeing is more uptake by uh, narrow casters, by VOD players. Uh, Netflix is probably using more stock footage than they did uh, because the stock footage that's available now is 4K res, where it wasn't six years ago. And, uh, you know, so I think there's an interesting turn in the market that people aren't considering. And at the, and then at the other end of the spectrum where, you know, we're talking about ad agency work or government institutions or, you know, whoever, uh, who are doing corporate videos and advertising, that's actually a more popular solution these days than hiring a crew. So let's run the numbers on it. Okay. So if you're hired as, you know, these days, and by the way, we had a big shift from you know production crews to one man band videographers doing a lot of this work, right? So I watched that happen as a producer. Uh, so it was part of the disruption that actually changed our ability to run a production company profitably in uh, 2015. Uh, things really changed, and up here in Canada there was another factor, and that was uh, cable people cutting cable. And going to VOD platforms really changed our funding formulas for TV up here. And I know that's the same in South Africa and lots of other jurisdictions. So, but that's a whole different discussion we should have in about six months or a year because it's a, it's a big conversation. So bottom line is, is to just answer your question. I think the market's very healthy. Uh, and, and in fact, the sales of black box content are, steadily growing every month okay even during down months we're doing very well um, one of the reasons that we are doing well is because we put in some quality controls about six months ago and now we have even more stringent quality controls which some people don't like you know they don't like having their footage rejected by us and uh, it's basically we just say look we want to take your best content into the marketplace because that's what's going to make you money so, uh, you know, we see it as a helpful thing, but we know there's, you know, people have some contention with that. And, you know, none of these systems can ever be perfect because they're not objective. They're very subjective. Uh, and even at all the agencies, the, 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 their, their review and, uh, sorry, uh, approval and rejection processes are highly subjective. Um, these are human beings making these decisions on what they're going to take and not take. And it's not, it's not objective technical review. We do a lot of that, but we also have to look at, you know, whether this is sellable or not. So, uh, you know, that's a whole kettle of fish that we can spend hours on. 
Uh, bottom line, though, is that what we want to do is get your content to market. So you make money and we make money. So that's not in dispute. It never will be in dispute. And we don't, we're not heavily curating. We just want to make sure that we don't send stuff through that uh, throws a wrench in the works uh, because it does affect our agency relationships when we're getting too many rejections. And we know this stuff inside and out. I mean, we've done a million clips. Who, who has done that? Right? Even as an individual creator, if you have 5,000 clips, that's, that's a pretty big pot. But we've got a million. And we're growing fast. Uh, things are moving along quickly. So it's going really well. So, uh, again, I hope I'm addressing your question, but I don't see this as a shrinking market. It's a growing market. The 80-20 rule is always going to apply. Okay, 20% of the people are going to make 80% of the money. So if you want to be in that 20%, you better do really good work. Because the people who are now coming to buy this content are not looking to fill holes in edits all the time. They're actually looking to make product, uh, sometimes. So uh, we see a massive, massive opportunity for Black Box to actually even offer our members uh, the ability to uh, manufacture some content, uh, possibly partnering with some of the contributors on the platform. Uh, and again, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but that's, those are the things that we're looking for. We're looking for the ability to maximize your contribution to this platform. So um, that's what's happening. And, and I can say personally, from my own personal portfolio, I go through periods where sales suck for two, three months, and then they perk up for four or five. But you got to remember, I put this stuff on here six years ago. I'm not going to get a 20-year life cycle out of a out of a stock footage clip unless it's something that's truly special. Um, but we're, I'm looking like I'm going to get a solid 10-year life cycle out of stuff that I put on the platform six years ago. Um, so I'm I'm pretty excited about that. Now, um, in in what you described is how the market seems to be going. I think if we had this conversation even two years ago, I, I might have had a little more disagreement on that. But look at what's happening today. And you don't, you know, Amazon went from being a retailer to creating their own content. Netflix went yeah. from distributing existing content to creating their own content. Hulu's creating their yeah. own content. You know, I mean, yeah. you have more and more of these services that are creating content, and that is generating billions of dollars in in revenue and they Maybe have billions. they have to get footage from somewhere and i look at the amount of content being created by amazon and netflix and hulu and it's massive amounts of content so it is. to me i i see that market as really getting ready to take off even though it's been going for a long time with all this new demand for content, there has to be a market for it, especially when you're talking, like you said, good quality, pro good production levels. It, it's it's got to be solid footage. And if it is, those are the licenses that are going to pick it up. And that's not where I see a, a $20 sale that day. That's where I'm going to see a three, four, five hundred dollars $500 sale that day. And that's the exciting one. You know, those are great sales to get. So let's run the numbers. So if you're a lone wolf videographer and you've got, I don't know, $10,000 kit, okay? And what do you want to make as a day as a day worker using that gear? Just throw me a number. What would you want to be paid? If you were on a gig for the day, how much would you want to be paid? Oh, yeah, which, I would imagine the local, the around here, the local day rate for that would be 2500 2500 okay, that's, that's an actually, that's a huge day rate, okay? So the global average is actually more around $400. And even in my market, you got, I'm, ta I'm not talking about high-level broadcast stuff here on a day call. I'm talking about corporate work, uh, you know, the local school system. Okay, yeah, that's going to that's gonna bring that number honest. way down. I don't think, that, I don't think that's $2,500. No, that, you're, you're probably right. You're going to be in the four, five, six dollars $600 range. Yeah, exactly. So... Uh, just to make sure we're comparing apples to apples here. So the guy that can go out and spend, or woman, sorry, I don't want to be sexist <laughs> at all. So the creator that, that does 
a day with um, some subject matter. Maybe you're just going to do puppies that day, or you're going to do crickets, or whatever. You're going to go do uh, some beautiful wildlife stuff. Or Squirrels and ducks out. hanging out at waterfalls. But, but, but you're going to put a 10-hour day in. Okay? <laughs> so if you're going to go hard, and how many clips can you generate in a day on a shoot like that? And probably quality clips, you're looking at between 30 and 50. All right? So you want to, the very worst you want to do is make 500 bucks out of that day, right? So if you have 50 clips at the end of the day and they generate $500 over the next several years, you're break. But in most instances, if you're doing quality work, and again, you know, this is a big caveat. You have to be good at what you do in order to make money on it. Sorry, this is not... This is not a money tree that you can just, you know, do average work or be an amateur and, and, and make the kind of money that a professional will. But I will tell you that, uh, you should be making three to 10 times a day rate over a period of five years with your footage. You should be. Uh, so what does that look like though? So if I'm going to make, uh, 10 times my day rate, that's five grand. Okay. And I've got 50 clips. So each clip has to generate $100 over five years. So each clip has to generate $20 a year, basically. That's completely possible to do. Is it going to happen in every instance? No. But the worst case scenario is that each clip makes $2 a year over five years. Okay? Because if 50 clips make $2 a year over five years, that's your day rate. And here's something that a lot of people don't even consider. Okay? You own that content, all right? So if you happen to be an older person and you own 10,000 clips and they're generating X dollars uh, per year, let's say it's that baseline made at $2 a year. So you're going to be making uh, 10 grand a year off of your portfolio. Uh, all right. And if it's super high quality, you're going to make more than that. So, but let's just say it'd be reasonable. So you're going to make 10 grand a year. So that's going to feather your nest or whatever your uh, fund money, however you want to look at it. Maybe it's mortgage money. Maybe it's rent money. I don't know. And, uh, but here's the cool thing is that if you, if you pass away, that's an actual chattel that you own that you can will to your heirs and they'll make the 10 grand a year after you die. So you show me a gig that you can do that with. Yeah. You know? That's so a great point. A, a side thing. So let's fast forward. Let's let's do the stock realm. Now let's just say that you were second unit on a feature film in Denver. Okay? And you didn't get paid on the day call, but you get a percentage of the movie. And that movie goes out goes on to do a hundred million dollars in the marketplace over ten years. That's a pretty sweet day. Right? <laughs> so Right? Yeah. So this is where we're going. So what we're talking about is the ability to co-own high quality content that has viability in the marketplace. Is it going to be, and by the way, we don't want to sell it to anybody. We want it on rev share deals all the way. Okay. So if it's a 50, 50 split with the VOD platform, are they all going to do this? No. Netflix probably won't, or they don't think they have to right now. But I got news for you. I mean, Netflix is about to get some heavy competition. And, and that business model that they've got going right now, which is to borrow a lot of money to make content for what they call the long tail revenue stream, may not work in their favor. I can't predict the future. But as a businessman, I look at it and I go, hmm, seems to me that content, okay, here's another thing. Content will never be king, all right? Distribution is always king, always has been, always will be. So don't go thinking content's king, because it's not. But I'll tell you what, content creators are the kingdom. And so when enough content creators are aggregated, maybe on black box, to make really awesome content that has market value, they start to develop a different relationship with the king. And the king will probably start behaving differently in a business relationship um, because they need that content to run their businesses. So we're not talking about screw the man or a revolution or anything like that. 
we're talking about a realignment of the value chain, so the value chain, so that content creators can actually play in the value chain and not be seen and treated at and budgeted as low cost labor. Because I do not want to be a low cost laborer, or I would have gone and worked as a low cost laborer 30 years ago. It wasn't in my life plan to be a low cost laborer. My life plan was to create content that was valued and hopefully uh, financially valued as well. Uh, because I don't want to be seen as a worker. I want to be seen as a content creator. And I think a lot of people feel the same way. Well, yeah, and the, the benefit of that footage sitting there and literally having the, the potential, let's, uh, let's be real, it has the potential to make you money over and over and over again for years. Uh, yeah. That's, that's just huge. Um, now, let's, let's kind of switch tables here and get away from the, the business side, and let's, let's actually talk about the, the footage side. And I, I know you're not going to like these questions because they're the ones that you get whenever someone signs up for the first time, but what makes for good stock footage? Well, I think that it's the same as anything else. It's like asking what makes great music, okay? So for any pursuit like this, you have to have a baseline of technical ability, technical resources, and the ability to execute, uh, I'm not going to use the word professional, but competently. So that's the baseline. If you wave the camera around like a tourist making a selfie video, you can forget it. You're, you're, not, you're not doing what, what we want you to do. So training experience, uh, practice, 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 fail a lot, um, and then start you know, thinking about you know, like I say, how do you know you've got a good shot? Well, your pulse will quicken a little bit when you're looking through the viewfinder. Um, you know, but learn how to shoot properly. I mean, cameras do not see like eyeball. So if you shoot like you see, well, that's not going to work. You have to develop the craft, the movements, the control as a shooter. I'm just talking about shooters here. And then there's this whole thing about, well, what do I shoot? Right? Well, we, we recommend that people shoot what they're passionate about. And if they don't feel particularly passionate about anything, well, why don't you find a partner uh, to work with to help you ID? And it might be your editor, because editors are pretty good at IDing stuff. Um, so there's a whole lot of craft. There's It's almost like alchemy, you know, like... Uh, you can spin some gold, but I can't give you the exact recipe because it's a mythical recipe. We don't really know what makes a hit song. But if you talk to a great songwriter like Carol Bayer Sager, who wrote hundreds and hundreds of songs, she will tell you that she doesn't know how to write a hit song. But she knows when she did write a hit song. Okay? <laughs> So this is part of being a creator. And I, I, I was a musician for years, and I was a composer, and I know exactly what she means by that. You know when you just something just came out of you that's right. So sometimes trying to force it is, is not a good thing, right? Um, I cannot teach you how to be creative. I can teach you how to pick up a camera, uh, to use a lens properly, to understand depth of field, to understand uh, all of these technical aspects, but the aesthetic aspects are harder to teach, definitely. And it's kind of like if you got it, you got it, and if you don't, you're gonna have to work harder. Um, you know, because for some people it just comes easier. Some other people you gotta work harder. Um, and then on the business side, well, knowing what will sell is the biggest question we get uh, by far. Absolutely. What will sell? How the hell do I know? I mean, honestly, uh, I wish I could give you that, that answer to that question, or I could make a quarter for every time I answer the question, but um, we really don't know, because I look at, I see all sales go through this platform, thousands and thousands of sales. There are some clips that sell repeatedly, and I can tell you that they sell repeatedly because they're unique and extremely well executed. And, uh, and they, they just sell because it's a good shot. Um, is it a particular type of shot that's selling more? Not really. 
I mean, if you run the categories, they're all pretty equal. You know, nature, wildlife, uh, landmarks, uh, human interactions, um, uh, what else? Uh, like iconic places, iconic things that are used to represent other concepts. Um, Life, lifestyle. Yeah. Lifestyle. I mean, just, just run it down. And the best thing to do, which we say in our literature, uh, and you know, sometimes it's, it's a little beguiling when, uh, when folks don't take advantage of the literature that we provide them because it's all there. Uh, but, uh, I mean, the common refrain is, you know, read the user guide, right? Well, if you read the user guide, you'll get a good idea on how to do this. Uh, so really, you know, all you need to do is just go to these distribution points uh, like Shutterstock, Pond5, Adobe, Storyblocks, and Vimeo, and just, they all have the ability to search by popular clip. And you can look at a thousand popular clips, and you can totally get an idea. It's no different than going through the top 100 songs for the last 10 years if you want to try to mimic uh, a hit song. It's all there. It's all historical. So we do not have a recipe for it, but we do know that there are, you know, there are some consistent themes that seem to draw buyers. Uh, but we're not, we're probably not going to be prescriptive in that regard. Um, because honestly, uh, if everybody's just mimicking everybody else, then it, uh, you know, you're not going to bring anything fresh in. And, uh, and that's how to dilute a market, by the way. If ever, if someone sees a, a popular clip and every single creator goes out and recreates that clip, well, that clip just became pretty useless in terms of financial. Well, so do your own thing and get really good at it. Do anything. You want to be a golfer? You got to put in 10,000 hours. You want to be an opera singer? You got to put in 10,000 hours. You want to be a doctor? You got to put in 10,000 hours. If you want to be a successful creator, you have to put in 10,000 hours. It's not going to happen by buying a new camera. That is definitely not it. Because I'll tell you right now, I can go out and buy a hockey stick tomorrow that is the best hockey stick. Anybody, of course, I'm using a Canadian analogy. <laughs> but I can buy a hockey stick tomorrow, but I am not going to get signed by um, the Boston Bruins anytime soon. Uh, I'm a big fan of Malcolm Gladwell myself. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, outliers. outliers. Yeah, I have. I have the book. Uh, now I have gone through, and I when I was starting to do this, I, I went through, and I, I I've done it even recently. Is gone through. I think Shutterstock has a good one where you can see the top selling clips from the previous month, and yeah. I I always tell people that that is probably some of the most worthless data you can get. Uh, today, right now, probably some of the, the hot clips are going to be fall footage, uh, the fall colors, especially when we have such beautiful stuff around here. Uh, my buddies who have some of that type of footage on, on Black Box, that footage is selling today. So now, next month, you go and you look at what the past month's sales were, and you're like, oh, fall footage. Well, I don't, I don't have any of that. Because it's not fall yet. Well, yeah, there's a lead time. And what was hot last month is not going to be hot this month. And, and, and so on. I mean, we're only a month or so away from winter stuff being uh, popular because of that production cycle. So looking at what is selling today is irrelevant to your planning unless you're planning on getting that footage done and having it sell next year. If you're doing anything to do with nature, uh, the sale, the, the footage that is going to sell is not the footage that you shot this season. It's footage that you shot previously. So you're absolutely right about that. So anything that is time dependent, Christmas is coming. Okay, great. How much Christmas footage did you bag last year? Because that's probably going to sell this year and the year after, but it probably didn't sell last year because all of the ads and all the movies about Christmas and all the TV shows about Christmas are being produced now in the middle of the summer. So it's just not going to work. But when you're talking about lifestyle stuff uh, or stuff that is not time stamped, uh, you can shoot it any time. 
lots lots of times uh, people put up a clip and get a sale within a week or two or a month. Sometimes they don't get a sale for a year. I've had clips in my own personal portfolio sit for three to four years, and then all of a sudden, bang, 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 uh, I get a bunch of sales. So, you know, that can happen any time. And this is, you know, this is a law of averages. Uh, that's the, really the only way to put it. You're not making a grain of sand. You're making a beach. Um, I just came up with that. I don't even know if that even works, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, you know, you're not making a grain, a granule, you know, a grain of sugar. You're making the whole sugar bowl. So when someone wants sugar, they're going to, they're going to go to the sugar bowl. They're not looking for your little grain there. Um, and they have lots of choice. So, you know, I can't predict the future, but I do know, I know one thing, and that's that human beings are storytellers and love stories. They also love novelty. They love beauty. They love thought provoking things. So when you're shooting, you know, you need to think when you're manufacturing this stock footage content, you kind of have to be able to put yourself into the seat of the viewer. And what does, what story does this tell? I mean, when I'm shooting nature stuff, I'm always looking for moments that are what we call anthropomorphic, where a bear is doing something human-like. Because the chances of that clip being used as a metaphor for something uh, are really, really huge. Um, and I've got, I've got some clips, nature clips that I personally have sold in excess of 400 times a clip because they're iconic in that way. And so I'm always looking for that moment when I shoot because what we're capturing here are moments in time that are used to illustrate a concept or a story or as a backdrop to something uh, uh, because there's meaning in this footage, right? So you're not, if you look at it strictly as a technical exercise, I, I think you're selling yourself short. You know, we're looking for conceptual meaning in these visual images that we're creating. Yeah, no, we have been covering a lot of ground. And uh, again, a lot of this stuff is things that I've seen in the Black Box Facebook group being asked, uh, questions I definitely had uh, early on trying to do it. And I, I'll see if you can answer this at least a little bit or, or give some guidance on it. I know one of the things that I struggle with uh, if I don't have a shoot that's planned that just happens to create some some footage that I can use, I struggle with coming up with an idea. And I, I look, I'm like, I have nothing to shoot. And as silly as that sounds sometimes, when I know that uh, I've met people who the guy sold, you know, like a dozen times a, a piece of footage of his microwave oven cutting, uh, counting down. And I'm just like, why am I not shooting everything? <laughs> there is so much out there to shoot, well, and I just get this mental block sometimes. Well, I mean, there's two ways to look at this. If you're doing opportunity shooting, run and gun, uh, you know, you're going to feel that way. But you know, all you have to do is is exactly what you need to do in any pursuit. You need to pick up your camera and you need to go, and that's it. So sitting and thinking about it's not going to help anybody. Again, a Canadian analogy here, but in hockey, you know, just shoot the puck, right? Uh, don't stand there thinking about it, analyzing it, uh, because if you're on the blue line and, and uh, you're going to try to score a goal, if you think about it for even a split second, somebody's going to level you or, or take the puck away from you, right? So shoot the puck, basically. Pick up the camera and go. Point it at something and find beauty in anything. I mean, I'm sitting here, uh, you know, in my home, and I'm looking around right now, and I've got, I can count them. Yeah, oh, that's a good one. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've got eight setups that I can do right now. So why haven't you Just done them? Well, I'm so busy talking to guys like you that, that 
I'm not going to do it right now. <laughs> but, you know, and in fact, you touched on an important point. I haven't been doing a lot of my own work for a few years because this ecosystem is really, uh, it's taking off. Uh, but honestly, like, uh, I've got a little, uh, a little gas, gas fired, uh, wood stove over here. So it's gas fired, uh, you know, appliance. And there's about probably 15 shots I could take of that thing, uh, right now. And if I got my wife to come down here, we could pose her uh, as a hand model or as a full body model and get her doing all kinds of stuff with it. And there's so many different keywords that can be associated with that. You know, uh, warmth, comfort, fossil fuels, global warming, global, global heating, global cooling, or whatever you want, right? Winter time. Um, we could take out all of our Christmas props right now and stage, uh, you know, uh, uh, Santa coming down the gas line <laughs> as a gag, uh, or well, there's all kinds of stuff. I got a dog. I could pose the dog there. We've got an exercise bike here. No brainer. All kinds of stuff you can do with that. Um, I've got some electronic devices, like, you know, whatever, like all kinds of stuff. It's quite incredible. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's really just a matter of opening your eyes and seeing and not overthinking, right? So just execute, just go, just do it, honestly. And, uh, and it's just, you know, if that's what drives you, then that's what you're going to want to do. So I think from, from my perspective, my, my background is more computer programming, uh, backend web design stuff, uh, very technical, logical stuff. Trying to be creative yep. doesn't come very naturally to me. Is that a skill that you pick up just by doing it more and more and more, like you're saying? Uh, there's two schools of thought. Some people think that artists are born, not made. I, I tend to be in that camp. Uh, I think it's how you're wired. As you say, uh, it's like trying to take somebody who is non-technical and teach them to be a data analyst. How hard would that be? You know, it, it wouldn't be an easy thing to do. So if you're a fish out of water, you're a fish out of water. But if you really like shooting and that's what turns you on, you'll find a way, but you just have to do it and, and try to learn how to be less analytical and to think about it less and let, let things flow. So that's kind of like a, a mental discipline issue. That's like a, you know, zeitgeist. Maybe do some yoga so you can learn how to free your mind. Uh, meditate uh, so you can learn how to free your mind from those analytical tendencies or these engineering thoughts that you're going to have. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole clinic that can be run around that. Uh, because, you know, I, get, I do get asked that, you know, like, what is your, what is your process? Well, some artists don't have a process, right? Some, you know, you have to wait for the muse as well. I mean, when I was writing music for a living, uh, holy smokes, I would sit and look at that keyboard for days sometimes. And then it would float. So how do you break the writer's block? You know, that's kind of the same question. Um, hard to say. For some people, they have to get up and do something else, and then they'll hit them. Some people get their best ideas in the shower, you know, if they're, if they're creators. Um, I'm one of those guys. I'm constantly hopping out of the shower and make a note on my iPhone. I need to get a waterproof iPhone. So I don't know where the muses hit, and I don't know if you can train that. I don't think you can. Uh, but you got to find your own way because if you want to do this, you know, you're going to be compelled to do it. And um, and again, you know, I refer to my my earlier statement. Anybody that, that is getting into stock footage just to make money probably won't. won't because they're missing a critical element and that's the passion and the care that goes on into making great visual uh, product. Now, you, you just brought up a very uh, good point and it's taking notes when you come up with an idea. And I know that is something that has helped me tremendously and I always kick myself when I forget to do it because invariably right. I will forget. And I go, what was that? It was sounded like such a good idea and I just, because I didn't take 10 seconds to write it down. Well, dude, I mean, like, why don't you just use uh, voice to text and make a note on your phone? Easiest thing in the world to do. 
Yeah, I, I've so, done that. I've rolled over in bed, grabbed my phone, and done a voice memo just so I could roll back over and go to sleep. Just so I, yeah. I'm like, something came to me, and I, I just want, yeah. I needed to get it down before yeah. um, it went away. So Absolutely I, true. I think Absolutely that's a, true. I think that's a really so, good skill. I mean, it's a big wide world out there, and there's a lot to do. And it, it, again, I, like I tell people, really master your passion first. So if if you want to be a fashion uh, related creator, dive into that. If uh, if weddings are your thing, go for it. There's no shame in doing weddings. Weddings are actually very beautiful things to do uh, because you're capturing uh, you're capturing a human event. Uh, if animals do the thing, then, you know, get really good at that. If you want to do technology, there's an awful lot to do there. Uh, if you want to work with actors, just, you know, so you can direct actors, there's, there's lots of stuff to do, right? And, and, you know, as you go along, you're going to want to, you know, again, you know, I think that one of the issues that we have today is that people think that gear will do it for them. You know, and it won't. So, hey, I just got a new gimbal and a new DL, DSL, mirrorless DSLR, uh, which is, I guess, a misnomer. A mirrorless <laughs> camera and a gimbal. Oh man, this is this is it. Wow. Well, that's not true. The, the cameras are a little bit easier than they used to be, um, but they're just tools. You know, like it's, you can use lots of analogies. Use a carpenter analogy. If I buy a Craftsman hammer or a Stanley hammer, and one's a little bit more expensive and a little bit better than the other one, is that really going to make me a better carpenter? Is it going to make me a car carpenter to start with? Absolutely not. You know, tools don't make the carpenter. Yeah. You know, absolutely. They just don't. So buying new gear is not the answer. Uh, putting in the hours and the time and the effort. And if you have talent, I say this often on, on the uh, Facebook group, you know, talent, team, time. Uh, yeah, we've talked a lot about a, a bunch of different stuff from the actual creation of footage to the, the business model and uh, where you think it's heading. I think that's the, uh, some of those are really great pieces in there. For someone that, that wants to get started and if they have questions, uh, I will vouch for the fact that you are very easy to, to get a hold of, to talk to. You've answered every question that I've ever brought up. Uh, is that just, is, do, you, do you still have time for that these days with as many members that are out there? Um, I always have time to talk to people and I love talking to people. The only caveat that I put on it is that if, if you've done your homework uh, and you understand uh, our user guide and our FAQs and our platform, it's going to make that conversation a lot easier because I don't have time to do like entry level onboarding training or even tech support. It's not my role. So, but if you do have a question or a concern or whatever, you just want to talk, even if you're uh, a naysayer and you want to beat me up for a bit, uh, I, I welcome those conversations because in fact, they usually end up being very, very positive once people realize that our mission is to help creators, you know, achieve freedom. And we're really serious about that. We, it's, it's the number one reason that I did this. It's our mission. And, uh, you know, so if, if you want to get in touch with me, you can do it through, uh, our, if you join the platform, by the way. Uh, so if you're a member, then you can get a hold of me on the Black Box Members Facebook group. Uh, you can uh, private message me. You can email me at members at blackbox.global. And I'm happy to have a conversation. We're going to be doing some cool stuff, actually. I've got some webinars planned, uh, possibly some live events uh, happening now that we've got uh, more users. And really, we're just trying to spread the word about uh, a way to, uh, you know, have a better life as a creator. And that's 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 what we're doing. So, Dave, thanks a lot for having me on your uh, your show. And I hope people find it of benefit. And uh, feel free to join at www.blackbox.global. Um, in cl I want to close with one last thing that uh, you didn't bring up before. Uh, you talked about being able to do revenue share with different 
people, the different members of your team and models and actors. But there, there's one more little revenue stream uh, to, to talk about real quick. And for full disclosure here, I'm not being sponsored by Black Box. They're not, they didn't pay to do this. I approached them, you know, Pat, to, to come on the show. There, there's no, nothing, uh, you know, fishy like that to, for me to promote them. But you can actually make money by referring people to the, the platform and you have a referral code that you can find in your account and you can post that. And if your friends sign up, you get um, like 1% of what they make. So it's a great incentive to kind of bring other people into the platform. And uh, to be totally honest, the link that you're going to find in the, des the description here is my referral code. That's the only benefit I'm going to get out of uh, any of this. If you sign up using my link, I'll get 1% of your sales. So I'm hoping a couple of you really get active and uh, make a lot of money out there. <laughs> and let's make sure people understand that that 1% does not come out of their money. It comes out of the black box 15%. So when Dave, uh, when someone signs up using Dave's link, uh, we pay the 1%. So we drop down from 15 to 14 and we pay the 1% to the, to Dave for bringing on new people. So that's great. Pat, thanks for joining. Uh, this is the, f you know, recently this channel was called Learn DaVinci Resolve. It's now Filmmaker Central. It's a, a lot more things for aspiring filmmakers and interviews like this to give you a way of monetizing the footage that you already have and to get out there and create more footage are some of the things that we're going to be doing here on the channel. So, Pat, thanks for joining and being our first guest on the show. Hey, dude, thanks a lot. It's been a real pleasure, and uh, we'll see you again. All right. Take care, Pat.